Hello and welcome, everyone, to the Republic of Azo. I am your host, Zach Yost. To start with, if you are one of the tiny handful of people on the planet who know what the historic uh, Republic of Azo was and thought that this podcast would be about the actual Republic of Azo, then I am sorry to disappoint you this podcast is actually about right-wing liberal humanism. For the rest of you, a short history lesson is in order to explain why this podcast is called The Republic of Azo and what it is all about. As many of you know, for a few hundred years, Japan was ruled under the auspices of the Tokugawa shogunate. Things changed after the U.S. showed up and demanded that Japan end its centuries-long policy of isolation or face the wrath of our big naval guns. This threw Japanese society into turmoil and led to the Meiji Restoration, where the emperor was empowered and the shogun replaced. Some remnants of the shogunate forces sailed to the northern island of Hokkaido, then called Ezo, where they quickly took over the island and established a samurai republic. It is important to note that these shogunate forces did not consider themselves to be rebelling against the emperor and were more seeking to firmly establish Japanese control over the island and to provide a home for the now powerless Tokugawa clan through which they would carry out, quote, faithful guardianship of the northern gate, end quote. Now, what is interesting about the Republic of Ezo is that it actually had the first elections in Japan. Only samurai were enfranchised, but still, this is quite a step forward. And while the Republic only existed for five months, it seems that to some degree it had a Smithian policy (laughs) of peace, easy taxes, and a tolerable administration of justice. But for our purposes, this short-lived existence is beneficial in that it allows for a rather aspirational and liberal understanding of the Republic, which can be seen in some aspects of Japanese popular culture, such as the uh, manga and anime, The Golden Kamoi, (laughs) where a samurai seeks to use a hidden hoard of gold to refound the Republic, import immigrants from around the world and quickly modernize the island to aid Japan in the geopolitical struggles he foresees ahead. In other words, one can interpret the Republic of Azo as an attempt to create a home for those who wish to use the best aspects of the past in order to boldly advance into the future. In short, that is what I am seeking to do here with this podcast, to establish a similar refuge for a routed and minority view in today's political landscape, that of right-wing liberal humanism. In an era of increasing political polarization towards extremes, liberalism has become a convenient punching bag for all sides and it is far from popular among young people. Like the liberals in 1930s Spain, the liberals of today increasingly find ourselves between a rock and a hard place. Many liberals have taken solace in Albert J. Knox's idea of the remnant, a small minority that seeks to preserve important truths through a dark age of barbarism and chaos. However, I find Knox's formulation to be too defeatist and pessimistic. America is fundamentally a liberal country. As much as radical elements on the left and right wish it were otherwise. 
One of the largest problems is that today's right-wing liberals find themselves scattered and divided without a shared identity or community. The Republic of Azo seeks to change all of that. This podcast will seek to spearhead the formation of this shared identity and form the basis for a liberal community dedicated to not going gently into that good night. The Republic of Azo is a fitting symbol for this community, not only because of its historic attempt to fuse together tradition and liberal change, but also because this liberal community will not be the mamby-pamby liberalism of Patrick Deneen and Sorab Amari's imagination. Rather, the Republic of Azo will explicitly advance a muscular vision of liberalism, as described by GMU economist Richard Wagner, that takes into account a liberal theory of social power. A romanticized liberal samurai republic will serve as the ideal symbol for this muscular liberal identity to be both molded and rallied around. So, as to what right-wing liberal humanism is, that is a complicated question. While I don't want to sound like a cringy millennial who thinks that I can't be constrained by labels, man, I have come to recognize that labels aren't that useful these days because increasingly words have different meanings to different people, which defeats the purpose of using a label to succinctly convey a lot of information quickly. So it may be useful to briefly discuss why I'm not using certain labels, specifically libertarian. I don't mind being identified as a libertarian and will use it in a conversation as a shortcut rather than having to go on for 10 minutes about what I mean by right-wing liberal humanist. However, one thing I dislike about the term libertarian is that people often say that libertarianism is only a political philosophy that has nothing to say beyond the proper, proper scope of government. I dislike that understanding because my understanding of politics is much larger and all-encompassing of human life. The Greek polis, where we get the word politics, was not just the state. To me, politics includes not only social life as a whole, but also one's own individual life and actions uh, that would not normally be classified as political. So, in my view, this very narrow conception of politics often leads to people holding views that are incomplete at best or contradictory and incoherent at worst. Relatedly, I find that some people also stunt their own personal growth by adopting libertarianism as their entire life philosophy remaining basically agnostic about the actions and choices that do not violate their conception of the non-aggression principle. I find that in both of these cases, the results are unsatisfactory. So, let's break down my attempt at forming a label here. What do I mean by right-wing? I think that the most simple definition of right-wing can be found in Russell Kirk's essay, Ten Conservative Principles, where he says, The great line of demarcation in modern politics, Eric Vogelin used to point out, is not a division between liberals on one side and totalitarians on the other. No. On one side of that line are all those men and women who fancy that the temporal order is the only order, and that material needs are their only needs, and that they may do as they like with the human patrimony. On the other side of that line are all those people who recognize an enduring moral order in the universe, a constant human nature, and high duties towards the order spiritual and order temporal. Or, another way to put it, is a belief in what C.S. Lewis calls the doctrine of objective value, 
the belief that certain attitudes are really true and others really false, to the kind of thing the universe is and the kind of things we are. Lewis identifies this doctrine of some sense of natural law as being present in virtually every human culture and civilization throughout history and identifies it as the Tao. Now, there is obviously a lot to unpack here, and I plan to eventually dive more in depth in future episodes, but I want to pause and take note of the use of Lewis's term, the Tao, which obviously stems from Chinese and Asian philosophy. And you may note that this show is named after a Japanese samurai republic, and that the logo incorporates the yin-yang symbol. This is all intentional. Like Lewis, I am a Christian in the Anglican tradition, and that will inevitably factor into this show. But I also think it is vitally important to recognize that being a Christian does not mean shutting oneself off from what other religions and schools of thought have to say. Indeed, Lewis himself recognizes this, saying, quote, If you are a Christian, you do not have to believe that all the other religions are simply wrong through and through. If you are a Christian, you are free to think that all these religions, even the queerest ones, contain at least some hint of truth. End quote. I think this is vitally important to understand, and I personally draw on Eric Vogelin's concept of differentiation, which is the process by which the truth of existence is understood and articulated in a more meaningful way. So from a Christian perspective, another way of saying this is that thanks to the incarnation of Christ, the literal personification of the word or the way, or as is often translated into Chinese, the Tao, Christianity is the highest level of differentiation, but that other religions and thinkers are not devoid of less developed conceptions and representations. Now, we will come back to this shortly because it is closely tied into what I mean when I say humanism, but now let's turn to liberalism. The word liberalism is the perfect example of how labels have become so next to useless in contemporary discourse. As listeners are likely familiar with, there has been no shortage of ink utilized in classical liberal and libertarians' gripes about how the word liberal has been bastardized to mean the exact opposite of what it used to mean. So, unsurprisingly, I adhere to this older understanding of the word liberal in the tradition of Adam Smith, Burke, Mises, and Hayek, among others. And yes, I, like Russell Kirk, consider Burke to be a liberal, and in fact consider the American conservative tradition to be a liberal tradition, which I anticipate that we will discuss much more in the future. Now, I think it is important here to pause and briefly discuss how democracy factors into liberalism. Democracy is not exactly the most popular word among some libertarians and liberals, and some are openly anti-democratic. But I think that this subject is quite fraught, because going back to my gripe about words and labels losing their shared understanding that makes them useful in the first place, it is often impossible to know what people mean when they use the term, which makes most arguments about it fruitless. Personally, I consider democratic government to be part of liberalism, but I hasten to add that my conception of democracy is not the same as most people's. Here I draw on James Burnham and his book, The Machiavellians, which I highly recommend to everyone if you can manage to get your hands on a copy at a half-decent price. According to Burnham, all societies, including ones that are considered democratic, are ruled by a minority, and that in the modern age we increasingly see democratic totalitarians where a Napoleonic figure claims to represent the whole people and to thus be governing democratically. 
But if one dispenses with all this talk of self-government in this sense, which Burnham states has never existed and never will, and use the term democracy as it is generally, though imprecisely, used today, he argues that, quote, a democracy means a political system in there exists liberty. That is what Mosca calls juridical defense, a measure of security for the individual which protects him from arbitrary and irresponsible exercise of personally held power. Liberty, or juridical defense, moreover, is summed up and focused on the right of opposition, the right of opponents of the currently governing elites to express publicly their opposition views and to organize to implement those views, end quote. So, personally, to the extent that democracy overlaps with what might be called liberty and facilitates the balance of power in society, which itself helps to preserve liberty in practice, I consider myself to be a liberal and democrat. But I hasten to stress that this conception of democracy does not automatically translate into advocating for one regime type or another to be considered the ideal type for any and all social groups in all times and all places. I think history clearly demonstrates that these principles are not only embodied in the current form of plebiscitary democracy. Now, I would also add that these views regarding ideal regimes are shared by both C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien. As how G.P. Kolbatch writes in his entry on politics in the J.R.R. Tolkien Encyclopedia, quote, Tolkien did not see any secular social system as answering all man's needs on earth because man was not ultimately created for earth, end quote. Or as C.S. Lewis puts it, quote, The practical problem of Christian politics is not that of drawing up schemes for a Christian society, but that of living as innocently as we can with unbelieving fellow subjects under unbelieving rulers who will never be perfectly wise and good and will sometimes be very wicked and foolish. End quote. Now, I would also like to address the adjective I appended to the word liberalism in the beginning, that of muscular. What is muscular liberalism? I think it can best be summed up as a recognition that power is an essential aspect of political life that cannot be ignored in favor of happy platitudes about justice or strident insistence on how the world should be working. GMU economist Richard Wagner differentiates between what he calls sentimental liberalism and muscular liberalism, the later of which recognizes that force and power will remain vital in a liberal social order. In Wagner's words, quote, For the muscular version of liberalism, free societies are not self-sustaining and can degenerate without the proper use of force. End quote. I think we can also quite safely say that Ludwig von Mises was certainly not a sentimental liberal. As he states in Liberalism, quote, What concerns us here is something quite different. Namely, the question whether people whose actions endanger the continued existence of society should be compelled to refrain from doing so. Life in society would be quite impossible if the people who desire its continued existence and who conduct themselves accordingly had to forgo the use of force and compulsion against those who were prepared to undermine society by their behavior. A small number of antisocial individuals, i.e., persons who are not willing or able to make the temporary sacrifices that society demands of them, could make all society impossible. Without the application of compulsion and coercion against the enemies of society, there could not be any life in society. End quote. 
Now, what I would say characterizes muscular liberalism from other forms of political thinking that accept that power is a necessary and inseparable part of political life is that its strategy of power is quite foreign to them. The muscular liberal does not seek to centralize power in the hands of the state so that he can then order things as he fantasizes. Rather, we recognize that the best way to preserve liberty is to ensure that power is dispersed throughout society so that social institutions can balance against one another. This is the basis of the phenomenal essay, The Balance of Power in Society, by sociologist Frank Tannenbaum, and it is echoed in many other thinkers, such as James Berner and Richard Wagner, when he states that, quote, Constitutions are what someone with authority to dominate the issue in question says it will be. In any conflict between guns and parchment, guns will win. What keeps that conflict in check and a liberal order from erosion is some conjunction of strong belief combined with arrangements of governance that require concurrence among different possessors of guns, and with each possessor able to maintain his own position, leading effective governance to require concurrence among the different possessors of guns. End quote. However, I would hasten to add that while guns are the determinant of last appeal, social conflict within a society is not as zero-sum as international conflict. As Tannenbaum points out, the various groups and institutions that hold social power are comprised of members who exist and participate in multiple groups at once. And while groups will try to establish themselves as what sociologist Robert Nisbet calls an individual's primary reference group, the interweaving of people's lives throughout the fabric of society has the potential to serve as an emergency break to social conflict running amok. So, you can see now another element of why I have found the Republic of Ezo to be a suitable name for this endeavor, with the samurai serving as an ideal symbol, as it were, of the kind of liberalism that fully understands that sentiments alone are not enough to uphold a liberal order. Now, here it is quite important to pivot to what I mean by the word humanism because the above section could be quite easily misunderstood and applied in a very inhumane way that elevates brute force and skullduggery beyond their proper scope. I have not really followed it much, but on Twitter there seem to be some people who have taken to calling themselves post-libertarians, and their gripe seems to be essentially with sentimental liberalism. As a result, they seem to have adopted a crude form of Machiavellianism. So, to fully flesh this out would require a great deal of time, but I think it is important to state that I consider myself to be a Machiavellian, and that I think the world would be a much better place if people were true Machiavellians, because he understood and advocated for the economic use of violence, which is in contrast to its unnecessary and uneconomic use that is much more frequent. Klaus Rinn, who has taken Machiavelli's insights even further in his work on what he calls moral realism, which is again something we can't explore in great depth today, but I think a helpful example of what this looks like is that one time when I was in a seminar with Klaus Rinn during my short-lived PhD student career at Catholic University, he used Machiavelli to argue against the use of nuclear weapons uh, on Japan in World War II. Now, this is something a vulgar Machiavellianism would not even contemplate, and I think it is important to avoid this vulgarized form. 
And as for our purposes here, I think it is very important to recognize that admitting enemies of liberalism exist, which muscular liberalism does, also then allows us to carry out the Christian duty of loving our enemies. Obviously, this is quite difficult. This is a hard teaching. Who can accept it, as they say? <laughs> but I believe that this is quite an important point and that we should briefly consider its implications because they are important even for non-Christians from a purely consequential standpoint. There is a great deal of hatred in today's politics, and I think it is not only counterproductive strategically when it comes to accomplishing one's own goals, but it also corrupts one's own immortal soul, and it is for nothing. Now, I will readily admit to being riled up from time to time about politics and many other things, but I don't think I have ever really been gripped by hatred. And I hasten to add that this does not stem from any cultivated virtue on my part. But I suspect rather more uh, the result of ingrained personality traits. On the big five aspect scale, I score in the 85th percentile when it comes to agreeable in agreeableness. And usually I am just too lazy to continue being very angry about things. So, hatred, to coin a phrase, is worse than a crime. It is a mistake. Hatred prevents you from seeing things clearly and as they are, and instead blinds you with rage. It infuses situations that require level-headed analysis and logic with wild emotion that clouds judgment. One need only look at the wild-eye assessments predicting imminent Russian doom and collapse in the war against Ukraine to see how out-of-touch hatred and unchecked emotionalism can blind people to obvious realities. And this hatred also has the additional negative effect of priming you to turn on anyone who attempts to dissuade you from the path of madness on which you have begun descending. Again, the accusations of being a Putin stooge leveled against people in favor of realism and restraint and it is another relevant example, though it happens all the time in other contexts as well. Beyond driving one to make strategic mistakes, it also puts your enemy in the driver's seat. Hatred is an inherently reactive emotion and it gives immense power to the people you despise. It would be difficult to find a more clear example of this than the masses of people who suffered from Trump derangement syndrome and ended up plunging off the deep end in the past few years. These people hate Trump, yet spent every waking moment obsessing over him to the great detriment of their own health and well-being, which, ironically, inevitably worked to Trump's advantage. It is no exaggeration to say that Trump debilitated a large number of people this way. Hatred to this degree is like catapulting disease-ridden corpses into your own castle. It is a complete own goal. Now, as my use of the term enemies implies, I do not think that the solution to hatred is to smoke weed in a drum circle and sing kumbaya. Rather, I think that level-headed Machiavellianism is the answer. That is to say, working to defeat your enemies does not require hatred. Rather, it requires that one work to master and discipline one's emotions so that they do not cloud your judgment. This is, of course, difficult, but it is not impossible. Machiavelli himself is one such example. Another is the German writer Ernst Jünger. Jünger was a <laughs> romantic German nationalist who wrote the book Storm of Steel as an account of his time in World War I. 
And let me tell you that it is one humdinger of a book. <laughs> uh, Junger seems to have had a jolly old time in the war and thought that w it would have been well worth dying for Germany. He recounts laying out and working on his tan once while the enemy was sporadically shelling his sector. But what is truly astonishing is that Junger's account is basically free from hatred. He is, in fact, explicit that he does not harbor ill will against the people he is shooting and bayoneting to death. He simply recognizes that due to the tragedy of human life, these two forces have been brought into opposition against each other and their perceived interests require this violent conflict. Beyond these strategic mistakes, hatred just inevitably makes people ugly. Well, this is often not a physical ugliness, like in Knights of the Old Republic, where your character's face turns sallow and sunken the further down you go on the dark side meter, but certainly an ugliness of spirit. People consumed by hatred come to take joy in wallowing in emotions that are unsuitable for a human. They take pleasure in vulgarity and mean-spiritedness, and in doing so, degrade their own soul. Again, I stress that I have not looked into this movement extensively, but I get this impression a great deal uh, when arguments with post-libertarians come across my Twitter feed. And I would also posit that perhaps this can, to some degree, be a byproduct of the attempt to main li maintain libertarianism as some kind of standalone, purely political philosophy in the narrow sense of that term. If you divorce these important, humane considerations from a political philosophy, it will not be difficult to descend into a dark place. But this humane attitude is essential, I would argue, to this intellectual endeavor because it extends to much more than just avoiding hatred. It opens one up to a whole new and wonderful world full of diversity and richness to explore. So what do I mean when I say humanism? I am not talking about secular humanism or anything like that. Rather, I am referring to humaneness, human qualities, in the vein of the Christian humanism of J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, or the new humanism of Irving Babbitt. In his book, Beyond Tenebrae, Brad Berzer lays out what he considers to be the five canons of humanism, which includes a belief in the dignity of the human person and that each person is unique, born in a certain time and place, and that real humanism never places the human person as the highest of all things, but as in the middle of all things. Man is higher than the animals, but lower than the divine. Klaus Rinn, in his book, A Common Human Ground, states that, quote, there have been recurring and systemic efforts over the centuries and across cultural boundaries to constrain the least admirable traits of humanity and to provide a higher potential of life, to foster characteristics seen as being the best and noblest, as well as a source for social cohesion and happiness, a label for the endeavor to cultivate what is highest in man, we might adopt the old word, humanism." End quote. Today, an often seen division in popular discourse is the division between the so-called global cosmopolitans who more or less want to turn the rest of the world into a homogenized global America where borders and differences are practically erased and those who argue in favor of the continued preservation of cultural distinctiveness and are often opposed to immigration and whatnot on these grounds. Another way of phrasing this is that 
there is great conflict between universal ideals and particularist ideals. Klaus Rinn transcends this debate by arguing that the universality, understood as these humanist values just mentioned, are in fact manifested in history, that is to say, reality, in the distinctive and unique particularity of time and place. Quote, contrary to postmodernist intellectual trends, Rin argues that this formulation affirms the existence, both actual and potential, of a shared unifying humanity, but it simultaneously affirms the great value of diversity. End quote. All right. Time to bring this all together. I know I just threw enough topics at you to take up a few semesters in college, and we're going to have to explore these all together much more deeply in the future. So why did I choose the Republic of Azo to represent this endeavor? To me, it seems that the symbolism works on a great many levels. One way to think about it is that it is a republic in the tradition of the Republic of Letters, our own little home in our time and place in history, where we will attempt to build a political, spiritual community that will be united in seeking to preserve and defend the liberal and humane values that I just laid out. Thanks to the internet, Albert J. Knox's idea of the scattered and disconnected remnant is out of date. We can and will build a community where these important ideas are preserved and fought for. These values are not popular today on both the left and the right. And to quote Mises, anti-liberalism is heading towards a general collapse of civilization. But if we believe them to be true, then it is our duty to fight to preserve them. We are a community dedicated to not going quietly into that good night. Samurai are awesome and cool and a fitting symbol for the muscular liberalism that we seek to embody. And like the samurai who formed the original Republic of Azo, we will seek to use the best of the past in guiding us into a future that is rapidly changing. To that end, in the coming weeks and months, I will continue to introduce you to thinkers and ideas and to facilitate conversations and dialogue through interviews and panels that I consider to be important to advancing our infant republic. I have no doubt that it will be as much a learning experience for me as it is for the rest of you. So. If this all sounds like something you are interested in and want to be a part of, then I would encourage you to subscribe to this podcast and to my substack, The Yoast Post. Both are free. And additionally, in the interest of fostering this community, I have formed a Republic of Azo Discord server, which is also free. So I encourage you to join that as well, where we can perhaps have some video call hangouts and share lit memes, as the youth say. I have a lot of other plans in store as our community grows, such as crowdfunding essay contests that could potentially be turned into books, in-person events and meetups, and maybe even eventually the launch of an online magazine and I am sure that you all will have many ideas of your own as well. And all of these links will be in the episode description. So thank you for joining me here today. I hope that you'll join me on this exciting intellectual adventure. And uh, just keep in mind, the enemy is many, and we are few. So gird up thy loins now like a man, strap on your katana, and let's get to work. I am your host, Zach Yost. Thank you so much for joining me today.